I don't ever feel competitive with other writers. I feel really competitive with other forms of media. Like Netflix drops a whole series that everyone's binging, or like you go viral on Twitter and everyone's, you know, tweeting at you, or your phone goes off, or your dog has. Like, I don't even feel like it's like you're in competition with other books. I think you're in competition with devices and streaming and you know what i mean there you have like no reason to finish a book anymore none yeah well and yeah. i gotta say you know as somebody who is like just drowning in books happily <laughs> that uh i don't understand how people keep up with all this shit like i i have not watched a single minute of succession like uh, that's just the one that comes to mind because everybody was so invested in it and i'm just like this feels like it's just beyond my ability i'm not saying that i wouldn't like it i'm just saying that like for me, it's a choice. You, I, I have to choose. I cannot do all of this. I am astounded by people who can like hoover in all of that culture. <laughs> I know, I know. I think maybe because sometimes the TV feels like a break from thinking, or I, I have been thinking a little bit more about like, what does adapting something look like? So I find myself reading things that have been adapted and then watching how they took it from a book into a series or a movie. I've been getting kind of fascinated by that. Um, one really good pairing. I just finished, I read Let the Right One In, which is so good. And the same thing you're talking about, really concise sections, so easy to blow through, like just haunting detective vampire, you know, and then even crazier, I'm pretty sure they call him Sweden Stephen King. I'm not going to butcher his name because I can't pronounce Swedish names and I'm not even going to try. But um, I think he wrote this in 2004, 2008. And like a third of the way through the book, the vampire changes genders and the pronouns change. And it just feels like so ahead of its time and so like fresh and it's just really, really excellently done. And that's one where I'm like, you know, I, I don't know, I, I just couldn't put it down. I, I love that feeling, that feeling I love so much. But I do think sometimes in literature, capital L, the author is like trying to impress you so much that reading it isn't that fun. It kind of feels like a chore sometimes. Yeah, and, well, and I, it's, it's interesting. Like I don't, cause I don't feel like there's anything light about your novel. I don't feel like there's any like lack of depth in terms of how you've drawn the character, especially the Cassie character, the protagonist. And yet, the, I think one thing I would note about it is that the prose style is very clear and simple. This is not like a super, you know, super long sentences and $50 words. There's none of that. Like it's, I think it's intentionally so like you're, you're wanting to create, like you said, I think before we started a page turning, uh, it, like experience for the reader, you want it to be a page turner, but also a work of literary fiction. Yeah. It's a, it's a hard balance. I mean, I think, I think more about the reader now, I think than I did the last book where I was just being weird because it felt good for me. And I think this time I did feel a little bit more conscious of how do I do that and like draw people in instead of repulse them. I, you know, I did feel that way a little bit. And, you know, I, I never liked those run on sentences. I always associate it with, I mean, East of Eden, where he spends like 10 pages describing a hill. And it's like, I don't know. It's not for me. I know I'm going to get killed. Steinbeck's a genius. I get it, but it's just not for me. Like I always love like a crisp short sentence. That's just like a gut punch. I think that's, I like poetry a lot because of that. And then I think towards the end of editing this, I was reading Deborah Levy's hot milk and she just has these sentences. And while I was reading it, I found myself just like pouring sentences out. And a lot of them ended up being like the ends of the sections like the gut punch last sentence. And my editor was like, where did these sentences come from? And I was like, I don't know, Deborah Levy. She just like reading her, I saw what she was doing. She was just flexing on sentences, but they were still simple and beautiful. And that really felt good to me, like to read that. Like you can still have a great sentence and it doesn't need to be 19,000 commas and run on forever, you know? Yeah, I know, I get it. I, and I sort of feel like the job of the writer is to say complex things in simple ways and to compress and to be as efficient as possible without losing anything. Yeah. Like that's the hard work that you're doing on behalf of the reader. I know there are different ways to skin the cat, like people might argue differently, but that's always been sort of my conception of it. I love that as a reader and I feel like your book does it despite being difficult and dark. And I think as I was telling you before we started, I feel like there's something very metal. <laughs> like when I finished this book, I was like, damn, you know, like, I, like it, uh, 
it is not a book, despite your attention to page turning and attention to the reader and wanting the reader to have an immersive experience. You're not making it easy on the reader either. This is not like sunshine and puppies. No, I think this is kind of someone, at least as a character, who is kind of standing on the edge of capitalism and all the things her parents taught her are, she's finding out they're not true, right? That if you work hard enough and if you, you know, do all the work, you're going to get a house and you're going to be stable and you're going to be secure. And that's not the world anymore, you know? And so I do think it's kind of like, I jokingly say this book is trying to capture like the day before Trump got elected, that like compression of everything is about to change in this irreversible way and we're never going back. And that is kind of the moment, you know, I think I was trying to get at. Um, and so that comes through in little things. I, I remember thinking about putting the headlines in and thinking about how we have these isolated experiences where we're staring at our phones and looking at this terrible news all the time and having these like what feel like very isolated panic attacks, but everyone else is having the same experience we are, and we, but we don't see it. We, you know, it, it, it is an intimate, sad moment between you and your phone when you're reading this headline and you're like, fuck, you know? And I was reading a lot of The Bell Jar and Play It As It Lays, and both of them really gave me permission to like pull in current events, you know, because they both really are engaging with the world as it existed. Usually I try to avoid that because I like to be surreal and like hang in a time that doesn't exist and a place that doesn't exist. But when I was reading both of those, especially the first couple pages for both of them, it was this kind of permission to say like, okay, you can have a place and you can have a time and it can still be timeless. You know, you don't need to um, completely do away with all that stuff. Plus, if it's going to be in San Francisco, like you're, you can't avoid it. You're going to have to just do it, you know. And the protagonist is named Cassie. Am I remembering correctly that the, there was a protagonist named Cassie in the Book of X? Yeah, it's all of my it's all of my uh, characters, which I'm sure somebody will write a thesis about one day when I'm dead. <laughs> um, but yeah, she just kind of runs alongside me. I don't like picking out names. I think a lot of authors like really fuck up when they pick out names. You know what I mean? And sometimes I'm like, this name is not realistic. Like people don't get, are not called this. And so once I had hers, I was like, this is just easier than I can't sit here all day fucking about with names. I don't like, but also too, you know, she is this kind of doomed, always can see the future, you know? And I think there is a way where, you know, there is going to be a way that these all kind of rabbit hole together and you know, I don't know, what is it, the Cassie multiverse? Is that what they call it in comics? <laughs> maybe it is. Is that, is that what, because it feels, it does feel intentional. It, it does feel like maybe what you're building. I think you, I mean, do you plan to have her appear in future books as well? Well, yeah, and that's kind of like the beauty of the black hole, right? Like you can read it two ways. Either she's destroyed or she's just going somewhere else to check out a different dimension, you know? Um, so yeah, I think there's always, you always try to leave it open a little bit. But yeah, I don't, I, I don't know. I might have to kind of call it the Cassie cycle. I'm not sick of her yet. I don't have any other names up my sleeve, you know. How would we characterize her for listeners who might not have read your work? Like, what what is Cassie to you? Like, she seems to be emblematic of our time. And I think uh, a young professional female experiencing this time, particularly in this novel, mm -hmm. you know, like, what else? How, how else do you conceive of her? I mean, I think she's kind of that part of all of us that feels weak and sad and might, we might not say out loud. I, that she's kind of been a channel for me of like my weakest moments. And I think when people find the work resonates with them, it gives me a little bit of relief that, you know, maybe this experience, the private moments when you're by yourself on a Sunday afternoon and you don't know what to do with yourself and maybe you start having anxiety or, you know, you're feeling depressed or you're just feeling listless maybe that that is more universal than we like to tell ourselves, you know? Like maybe mm. everybody else on a Sunday afternoon is sitting at home going, I don't know what to do with myself and I'm having a weird feeling and, you know, but yeah, I think she is kind of, is she someone I would want to spend a ton of time with? Probably not, she's pretty sad, <laughs> you know? Um, but I do have that part of me for sure. And so I always feel gross when the books come out because it always feels like these really vulnerable parts of me and then everyone gets them and then they have thoughts on it and it's like, uh, uh, uh. Yeah, but I yeah. think a lot of people, especially your best readers, the ones who are going to really connect with it will feel a sense of relief in the way that you draw, perhaps in particular, the real true interior darkness of Cassie, which mirrors, I think, the true interior darkness of 
just about all of us, except for those very strange people who have like the neurochemistry of like Bozo the Clown or whatever. You know, where I they're jokingly, just... <laughs> I'm like the only people who aren't going to get this are Republicans. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, but I don't know what it is. But I feel like the, you know, I feel like the interior conversations that she is having with herself when she is at her lowest moments, when she is filled with the most dread, are very recognizable. And also something that you don't often hear vocalized, uh, especially in day-to-day -day life, or rendered this well in fiction. You do a really nice job of that, and there's courage in that because, like you say, I think you open yourself up a little bit when you do that. There's something vulnerable about putting that stuff down on the page. But I think for the readers for whom it is for, it comes as a relief. I was thinking about this when people ask, like, what do you hope this book does? And I think in visual art, I think I was interviewing this artist, Anne Hamilton, and she was talking about this installation she did. And you go into the installation and you stand in the center of like a ring of curtains and you pull these pulleys and they spin around you. And there's all, but there's so many circles, right? So there's all these people standing in different curtains, spinning them around. And she talks about this concept of how she wants people to feel alone together. And I do feel like that's kind of what this book is getting at, you know, not to compare my work to hers because she's brilliant, but like this idea that this, these private thoughts that you have are more universal than maybe you think is, is probably what I'm getting at. And also, I guess we don't talk about this a lot, but how many times have you had to go to work when like something terrible is happening and you're just like, I, I can't do this today. I can't do it, and you, but you have to, you know? I remember after my father died, I think I took a week off and I went back to work, and that sort of wasn't my job's fault. It just felt implied that I shouldn't take more time. And I had a coworker who's uh, from India, and her father had also died, and she like went back for a month and just stayed with her family and like really sat with it. And I kept thinking like, what a different experience that must have been in terms of grief to actually like go sit with it and spend time instead of like immediately rushing back and thinking I have to put on a good face. I have to cry between meetings in the bathroom, <laughs> right? Like that whole experience. Um, and so I think even culturally, that's kind of a question worth asking or thinking about, you know? Well, I mean, so much of what this book is about is about the inhumanity of late capitalism, the ways in which office culture can become really twisted and toxic and the gold rush mentality that I think is particularly pervasive in startup culture and especially in San Francisco startup culture <laughs> where there is all of this money, like this absurd money, you know, flowing through that city. And yet at the same time, the most heartbreaking poverty and human, uh, what's the word? Just human tragedy, just yeah. uh, kind of colliding against one another. You draw that very well. And so, you know, it just seems like a great human failing that somebody would lose a family member and have those kinds of feelings. Or there wouldn't be something in place where like, yeah, if you're mourning the loss of a close family member, like you get at least, at least two weeks, <laughs> like to also, go. Like, why don't we get, we, first of all, we should get more maternity and paternity leave, but also shouldn't that apply to a death? Like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. If, if you spend that much time bringing life into the world, wouldn't you also spend some kind of time releasing it, like, or figuring out how to exist without someone who, like, might have been, like, a leg to you? You know what I mean? Like, right, right. Yeah, I rem yeah, and I do think, you know, going back to the San Francisco portion, I had moved out there, and I was there for a year, and I remember feeling like I was just standing on the edge of the world and just, like, watching everything crumble around me and the parts of the book you know obviously everything in the book is not real that's not how that is um but the parts that are real you know I had a man that lived under my window for a year and I felt myself connected to this person who was suffering at all times and what do you do with that right I have no way to help him I can call the police which is obviously not what I'm gonna do I can leave food and money but like long term I really can't do anything and now we're we were just linked to each other in a way, you know, where I could just hear him in so much pain. And I, you know, what do you do with that? I don't know. And sometimes I'm like, you know, oh, this book should have answers. There's not really like an answer to capitalism. There's not really an answer to like the housing crisis. Um, you know, obviously we know what we should do, but we're not doing it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, we're just not. So 
Um, mm-hmm. the, the, the responses to the biggest quandaries that I think we face are much more radical than it seems like we're prepared to undertake. Yeah, I think, well, there's a couple things. Well, first of all, when I first wrote this, uh, now I don't think it needs to be set in San Francisco. At this point, I think you could scratch that out and put it in any city and you would be dealing with pretty much the same thing. But I will say by setting it in San Francisco, like San Francisco is such a poignant place to set a story like this because it is such a beautiful place. Yeah. It has so much going for it, but to have both like this darkness and this light sort of happening at the same time might heighten the effect. It's a good choice. Uh, that's interesting you say that. I was kind of dreading it because there's been so many books. Like I, I kept thinking like, oh God, everyone's going to hear about a novel set in San Francisco. It's about tech culture. Roll your eyes, right? And so that was something that I really struggled with because it seems on its face so done you know, but I also felt like most of what was done there was first of all, centered on men or centered on people who like eventually bought in and just cashed out. And, you know, when, even if they went there and they didn't agree with it, they eventually got enough money to shut up about it. Um, you know, and so it is a fascinating place. And also I think it's even more fascinating if you think about the way it's, spread to every other city like now seattle right like you cannot live anywhere and pay less than two thousand dollars a month in rent like it's over you know i never thought i would live in los angeles but by the time i left austin it's pretty much the same amount of money to live anywhere now and that's crazy to me because if you would have talked to me when i was like you know 20 i never would think i would be living in los angeles ever i am i am not the me neither I, i'm always surprised that i ended up here like for my life basically but you know, life works in strange ways. And I am not an expert on the housing crisis or on any of its underpinnings, but I have heard both from friends and a bit in the news that like during some of these economic downturns, like the crash in 2008, the associated crash and downturn that happened along with the pandemic, that these huge like holding companies or hedge funds are kind of going through and buying up a lot of the housing. Yeah, I think there's also something, especially in New York, somebody just did a really good article about the number of apartments that are empty because there's some kind of like thing. If you leave the apartment empty and you declare it being under renovation, you can get some kind of tax credit for it that is sometimes worth more than the rent and it keeps all the other properties really expensive. So you have you know, I, I forget where I read it, but it was like, you know, 35% of New York City is like actually empty. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, right. no one's no one's even there. Um, but yeah, it's crazy. And then you think about, I think after World War II, the president had put this thing into effect where like houses, I'm going to translate this to today's money. I think houses couldn't be more than $200,000 and rent couldn't be more than 1500 after the war. So people could come back and afford to live. And it's like, oh, that's where all of our parents got houses. That's where our grandparents, like, that's how all of them had stability was, it wasn't bootstrapping. It was literally, there was a cap and I, we know what to do. If we did that for even a year, even a year, how many more people would be able to have housing? You know what I mean? It wouldn't even, it wouldn't even take that long, probably. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but that it would change my life a hundred percent, you know? Right, right. Um, but we're, we live in unchecked, unregulated, you know, so. Well, this book is about a young woman who leaves home, moves to San Francisco to kind of go in search of gold, right? It's the, that's the gold rush narrative that so many people are trying to live out in modern times in this tech economy. And I feel like the relationship in particular between Cassie and her father is beautifully and touchingly drawn. The whole family dynamic, but the communication, this dichotomy between, you know, Cassie's gold rush experience, the success that she's having. This is what's so maddening about the economy is that you can be successful at what you do and still impoverished. (laughs) You can be, you can be working so hard and it, just doesn't fucking matter this is the shit i will not say on twitter because i will get eaten alive but i mean even this book the government took so much of my advance that i couldn't believe it like it's one thing for them to tax the physical object it's another thing for them to tax this thing that i worked on 
that they did nothing to support. They actually actively did everything to make it impossible for me to be a writer. And they're still taking so much of it. It hurts my feelings. It radicalizes me. And that's the stuff I can't say on Twitter is that I get like, even if you saw my advance on paper, it might sound nice, but guess where all of it went? <laughs> it didn't, it didn't go to me. It right. did not. And my agent earned his cut. So that's not a problem. He did so much work on this book with me. He was all in. I feel great about that. But when I think about the government showing up at the last minute to be like, actually, right. almost half of that's ours. Right. What? Right. What? <laughs> and yet, <laughs> and yet, if we're going to put a cap on housing and we're going to make it more affordable and equitable and we're going to regulate and stuff like that. Usually that means higher taxes. I don't know. I mean, I'm not, there's no solution. Look, look, I honestly, anything that you and I come up with here is going to be, the reality is some people are doing really great right now and think, and it's made all of us kind of eat each other alive because it always looks like someone else has it better than you. But you know, when you actually put the books down, all of us are fighting over the same middle to lower class swath <laughs> and, and you know it sucks because the rich people are the really rich people <laughs> they're you know really I mean? the rich people are really fucking rich and everybody, yeah. everybody else is just basically some version of poor well, and it runs the gamut i mean it's not like i mean there are some people who are truly in a bad state and then there are other people who are just living paycheck to paycheck or like hanging on by their fingernails in some way but well what really blew my mind I was watching a documentary when I lived in San Francisco about the housing crisis. And they were speaking to an unhoused man. And I, by the way, it kind of, it's so funny. Like you're not supposed to say homeless anymore. So I keep trying to make sure I say unhoused, but right. I keep thinking about this man and I'm like, would he give a shit <laughs> about either one of these phrases? I don't think he would. Anyway, this unhoused man was saying like, you don't understand. You're only two paychecks away, away from where I am. And that has really stuck with me because the reality is even those of us who think we're doing great, if you really got down to it, if you didn't have paychecks for how many months, would you really be okay? And it's not many. And so, yes, obviously there's a big difference between poverty and that. And also it's true that the cost of living, inflation, everything is so expensive, taxes, all of it. Like, you know, America is like this because everyone's just not a millionaire yet. That's the problem. Our capitalism is so aspirational that we cannot talk about class, which is the reality, you know, when you look at France and everyone's like laying down on the train tracks and like working together, we don't you're do talking, that. You're talking about French protest. Yeah, they kick ass. And we don't do it that way. We like protest in factions. We once in a while, we'll get our shit together and we'll, you know, try to have a group go. But you know, it's, that's the kind of thing where I wish we would talk a little bit more about the fact yeah. that I don't think all of us are doing that great. No. And I feel like, yeah, I, I do. I have the same feeling about France. I'm, I'm just like, damn, like when they are mad about something, they stop the trains. They, like, <laughs> they're out nope. in the streets and like they have a real sense of civic duty in that respect. And it feels like the government of France has a, like a fear of the people, a healthy fear of the people. Whereas in America, I feel like the people have a fear of the government. And that is also probably healthy. You know, um, I think I think what this book also does try to get at is like the idea of protesting on nights and weekends. Right. And my dad used to say all the time, like if everyone didn't work 40 hours a week, we would be in Washington every minute they did something messed up. But we don't have time, you know, um, and you kind of brought up the father character of the book. That one is very kind of near and dear to me because my father had asked me to write this book. And then when he passed away, we kind of went into lockdown like right away. And so I was kind of just stuck alone with like all this grief. And I did Ugh. not know what to do with myself because I didn't have like a way to escape it at all. And what, like, ha all what happened? What happened to him? Uh, he had a heart attack. Suddenly. Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And um, so I couldn't really think of what else to do other than like write this book that he asked me to write. And like as I was writing, I was just trying to like not forget him like no it's it feels yeah. that way it feels elegiac and it's beautifully drawn and he would be very proud and i think the uh that's such a loving thing to do it, uh, you'll be very glad i think i bet you feel that way now but especially as time goes by to have rendered at least some version of him on the page like this he's a he's a wonderful character and he clearly loves cassie 
quite a lot. They have a very special connection and a very special bond. That is, I think, the heart of the book. My uh, my agent was like, this is like a love letter. And I was like, you know, kind of, because you get worried sometimes. Like, are you going to forget how they smelled or how they sounded or, you know, and I didn't really know what else to do. Yeah, especially with the lockdown. I mean, that's all, it's hard enough. And then to then have to go into like isolation, essentially. Yeah, just... and I, I think I, when I when I would call him from San Francisco, he would always be like, write this down. One day you're going to write a book about it. You're going to make a million dollars because no one's going to believe any of this is true. And sometimes I see that like on Goodreads. They're like, this is all unbelievable. No one would act like this. And in the back of my head, I'm like, Have... <laughs> wouldn't they though? <laughs> wouldn't everyone act exactly like this? You know? Um, and so, yeah, there was part of that where it was like, you know, I had written the first 50 pages, I think, in 2018 before the Book of X came out because, um, you know, for the Book of X, no agents wanted to take it on. So, you know, I gave up on agents. And then, like, a couple months before it came out, they started knocking. You know, they come knock around after. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, now it's okay, I guess. Um, but the only one, I went with Kent Wolf because he understands what I'm doing, but he was the only agent that said he wanted to see new work before he would take me on. And I actually really needed that. I needed someone to like, get me out of the book of X and get me to start thinking like, you're going to have another book. You're not going to be in this one forever. So start thinking about it. And so I think I wrote the first 50 pages for him and they're pretty close to what is there now, like pretty close. Oh. Um, and then I put it aside and I went on book tour and, you know, my dad died. I went on lockdown, you know, and so it, it was a little bit before I got back to it. And then um, I wrote it pretty fast, the first draft, but I was really, I don't say militant, but I kind of was. I had a, like, a pretty strict schedule for the first draft. And then we were editing for probably like three years. I mean, just lots and lots of edits, like three times back and forth with Kent. And then after we sold it to Emily at Scribner, then three times with her. You know, it just, and so, um, yeah, it, it's so funny. I think I interviewed Melissa Broder and she said, you know, the more effortless it looked, the longer it took, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> and it's really, really true. We, I agree, it's, but it's, that's, that's the hard work that you do on behalf of the reader. And this is a book that feels fully cooked to me. Not every book does. There's something about the efficiency of the storytelling. I don't think you get there in the absence of rigorous editing. And I think that, especially if you're working on a relatively quick time frame, which is to say like three years, <laughs> you know, like, it's like books are complex. Mm -hmm. And unless, I mean, maybe there's some brilliant person or there's some particular story that shoots out of a person sort of all, you know, it's like turnkey, you know, but I think that if you're working relatively quickly, you need an agent, you need an editor to actually invest in the project with you and to help push back and to force your hand when um, they see things that aren't work aren't quite working or could be better even just a little bit and yeah. in the absence in the absence of that I think you can send a book out into the world that's not quite there I think there's two things the first is plot I think people love to bitch at me on Twitter about this but if you don't have an outline before you sit down to write that is the quickest way to spend 10 years on something that it and plot isn't that complicated okay we have loved the same plots since the dawn of time the shit was drawn on cave walls it was in the Bible it's in mythology like that is the part where I'm like don't overthink it like get a plot you got a character something happens pick the right time you know and with this one that and I think this when I look back at the Book of X, there's a lot of stuff I see now that I'm like, uh, I, you know, if I had a little more experience, I would have done it differently, you know. Um, and I thought I don't want to do a whole life. That is how you get lost in the sauce is doing a whole life. I want to do literally. I said six weeks of someone's life. And what is the quickest way to make six weeks really matter? Well, she's got to be pregnant, right? Because that's that's it. It's gonna and that speeds up everything. What I had this down to the day and I took it out in edits, but it would say like it's Thursday, right? Like every section would set, tell you what day it was of the week. And I, you know, through edits you can start taking that stuff out, but we knew, I mean, even my editor at Scribner was the one who really made it end on March 15th or 16th because that was the day we went into lockdown or had to start wearing masks and she like we had calendars. You know, and that's the fastest way to like make it happen quick is put some pressure on it, you know. Um, mm. Well, let's let's make sure we set this up in a broad sense for for <laughs> listeners. Sorry. We've, no, it's okay. We've talked about it. Like Cassie 
moves west from where's she from? She from Philly. Hey, I was thinking Pennsylvania. Yeah, because yeah. that's you. <laughs> and so moves west in search of gold. Her parents and, and she's also, I think, like making a, a reach up the ladder in terms of class. Like you can feel that and her parents and her father in particular really cheering her on. She has a more complicated relationship with her mother, who we have not mentioned, but it's loving but complicated. <laughs> um, and then she is at this job at this company called Voyager, which is a tech startup. And we're going to talk more about it, but it's, it's like kind of a, a quintessential tech startup. There's like a messianic CEO. I love the phrase small gods that you use in this novel to refer <laughs> to refer to like the people in the C-suite at the tech startup. Yeah. The ones who get to debate over everybody's heads behind closed doors. So they have to have their private conversations. And <laughs> small gods is just right. <laughs> and she is also, Cassie is, you know, she's a young single woman. She's seeing a guy, the chef. He is a chef at a restaurant in San Francisco. And he is in an open relationship with another woman. So she's sort of the, the second woman, yeah. which is an odd place to be. And so that relationship is happening. And then there is this issue of pregnancy. Is mm -hmm. she or isn't she? Mm -hmm. That sort of drives the narrative and raises the stakes and puts time pressure on it, right? Yeah. Um, there are friends that she has who I think share in her darkness to some extent and who share in maybe some of the professional angst in particular. Who's the one? Is it Maria or Nicole who has like an NDA and like literally can't talk about her job? It's Maria and yeah. that is a real thing. That is, yeah. yeah. But, but it's funny. It's, it's also funny. It's like so <laughs> absurd. She's like, I literally can't talk about it. You know? <laughs> so that's kind of the setup. Am I missing anything? No, that's, I think you got it. That's oh, she does have a black hole that follows her around. I guess we should mention that. that. Yeah, which I... <laughs> <laughs> that this is, and that this is a recurring motif throughout the book is this, uh, you know, this almost like a nonfiction element to the novel where you're learning as the reader about black holes, you're learning at the same time about like pomegranates. There are certain things that you're sort of touching on. It feels, mm -hmm. I think, it, I mean, you tell me, but I know that you have a strong interest in visual art. It is reflected in Cassie in this novel, and it feels like something that you have built in this work of literature that you might be drawing from visual art to create. Do you know what I'm saying? Is that? Yeah. Anywhere? Yeah. I was definitely interested. I mean, if they would have let me make the book into like a circle, I probably would have <laughs> been truly happy. I did. I, I like, it's going to sound like so asshole -ish, but I just always try to write a novel that hasn't been done before. In the first place, I'll usually start a structure, right? Like how, how could you structure a book differently? And so it sounds egotistical, but it's more like I want to play. And and that's the fun part. Like in the beginning, it's just I'm sitting around getting obsessed with something. And it was pomegranates for this one. I couldn't even tell you why. I, I don't even remember why. I just know that I started buying them and eating them and cutting them open. I think it was something about how visceral they looked. And they were so delicious, but they also were like gross. Like they look like a bunch of teeth or intestines. Like it's the craziest <laughs> fruit. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. And, and so there was something about that. And then I started watching like the color of pomegranates, which is this crazy, um, a poet made it as like a visual memoir of his life. And it, once you watch it, you can see the visual references are used everywhere in culture. Like I think Lady Gaga ripped it off in one of her videos and she is clear about it. But so I just like really fell down the rabbit hole. And um, actually some of the stuff was just fascinating. Like I didn't know that most historians, like there's a lot of historians who say that was the fruit for the Garden of Eden, not the apple. Right. Because, yeah, right. Did, so, you, did, you, did you know that before you latched on to pomegranates or was it something that you discovered in the process? It was, I think it was one of the early things that got me interested in them. And then the visceral, like the texture of them. And every time I cut one open, it was just kind of this blood spatter, you know? And it, I, I, yeah, so I just kind of got obsessed. And then um, I was painting them. Like I, I was just trying to figure them out. And so- Do you paint? Uh, no, I'm not good. <laughs> but like recreationally, regularly I, do you paint? I just like, okay, so this is actually so weird and I don't know how to explain it the painting that ended up on the cover i had printed that out during covid and was trying to paint it myself by hand so that when i wasn't writing i was still thinking about it and 
at some point when we were looking at covers, I had sent over a ton of art that I had been looking at because there's, you know, I would go into all the art museum websites and look at everything they had for pomegranates. I would go into like MoMA and look through all their archives and, you know, because all of that was online. Um, and so that painting, I had sent over I have so many images and somehow I ended up on the cover, which always kind of blows my mind that I had been uh, messing around with that and trying to figure out how to paint it. <laughs> Was like good. Uh. It's, a, it's a good. It's a good cover. Uh, yeah, no, I got really lucky. I got really, really lucky. Yeah, I, I do think I have to say Scribner. You know, especially my editor and the art, they just understood it and they didn't try to turn it into something that it wasn't. And so I got very lucky with that. I, I really, really did. Yeah, I mean, it's a really dark novel, but it does have its humor, and I think it's very relatable and contemporary, and propulsive. And I think that maybe that's what allows the darkness to live. <laughs> um, I think in a novel that's less of a page turner, people might get bogged down or something, or editors might be like, you know what, this is, but this book is a page turner and Cassie is such a sympathetic heroine. And I think that her experiences are relatable to so many of us. And something that I wanna talk about, which I could definitely relate to because I've worked in startups before, is the way in which tech startup culture creeps me the fuck out, first of all. <laughs> uh, I think you might share this. It, it's like, it's a lot. It's a lot for somebody who's wired like me. And just like when you, I was reading in the novel about like the, the bi-weekly all hands meeting, if I ever, you know, if I never have to attend a fucking all hands meeting for the rest of my life, I will die happy. <laughs> Like nothing worse than a fucking all hands. I meeting. know, I know. And, and everybody's awesome. there, and and you ever like, there's a slideshow, and the CEO's up there, and like then all of a sudden it's like somebody's worked at the company for seven years, and they put their picture up, and then they get a backpack, or that stuff is so spot on. I have lived through those meetings and have just been wildly uncomfortable in them. <laughs> it's crazy because I was thinking about this when I wrote it we go through these cycles where the capitalism like reshapes itself. But is this that different from like the culture in the eighties where you became like a sales dude and you did cocaine and, or, you know what I mean? Like they, they also had their whole little like ways to sell better. And like, you know, and then you think about like multi-level marketing, right? Like they've got their whole little, it's like very cult like, and it just takes a different shape. And, but it's still, the same thing is still there. It's just dudes who need to make money, but now they're not wearing suits. They're gonna wear a fleece pullover and act like they're your friend. And, um, you know, I will give a lot of credit. To one of the startups that I worked for, I'll never forget, they took something out of like, you know, the company standards because it made it sound like everyone was friends and they took it out and replaced it with like performance driven and they were like, we're not friends. <laughs> And I was like, you know what? I actually respect this more than you pretending we're a family. Like they were basically like, if you don't perform, you don't work here anymore. And I was like, you know what? I think they replaced something like, you know, <laughs> we're a family and they changed it to like performance first. And you're like, okay, you know what? At least you're not like lying. Right, right. But, but I mean, you know, honest. they are, there is such a thing I think as work family simply in the sense that you're spending so much fucking time with people day in and day out isn't it like, weird isn't yeah. it really weird and like you learn people's tics like i remember i had this guy that every morning at 10 a.m he would eat a small bag of chips next to me and i have to listen to him eat chips okay and that's like something only a wife should have to put up with right like i shouldn't have to be assaulted by that sound at 10. Right. that's a very intimate thing you know and so I don't know why I just I never forgot that he if he hears this I'm sorry to you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like it's intimate. It's intimate, and I think that it is, especially as time progresses and you get to know people as human beings. At least this was my experience of it. It isn't that I'm like oh this is my family, but that these these are people that I know, and so at some point, either early or late or somewhere in between, there does come this strange collision between the personal and the professional. Mm -hmm. And to reduce somebody that you have spent a lot of your time with to performance metrics and to- Also fucked up, right? Both, yeah. both, both are wrong. I just, yeah, it's like, you know, you don't want to enforce fam like uh, family members upon people who are not blood relatives. But I don't know, like the humanity issue 
is troubling to me, especially for people who have really put in time. Yeah. Like, I want to say ESPN just laid off a bunch of people. It's just prominent because it was in the news, but it happens all over the place all the time. And casting people out into the street because they didn't hit some benchmark or just because the money ran out from your venture capitalists and there aren't... I mean, some of this is just harsh realities of business, but it's really... I'm not built for that shit. (laughs) I mean, I will say, especially my suspicion with the layoffs now is just that it looks good to the stock market. I mean, honestly, because I don't see a world in which, you know, there aren't things you can do before you get to that point. You know, like... I'm sure the, let's put it this way. I'm sure, I I would be shocked if the executives in the C-suite took a set, took a big pay cut. You know, this is, this is kind of something I, I just did an Esquire's doing a piece, I think on like novels about tech. And I was trying to talk about how the layoffs specifically, it's so easy to be like, oh, it's just some guy in a scooter. He doesn't deserve to have a job, but like, that's not who's getting laid off. Like, let's be really clear. It's the people who are lower middle class who never tried to do this, but it was the only industry that was paying, right? Like I was gonna be a professor. That's not a job. (laughs) Not an easy one to get, not an easy one to get. Let's be honest, I I saw the numbers. It's like 0.025% chance that you would be a tenured professor right now. That's how hard it is to get that job. And so I'm like, okay, I adjunct it at seven places and I make $37,000 a year and I have no healthcare or I go to tech where I at least will be, even if it's toxic and I'm treated crazy, at least I will have a 401k, I will have healthcare, I will be paid enough to take care of myself without having to get married to some dude, you know, like, and so when we talk about these layoffs, it's like, that's who's getting laid off. It's not the guy on the scooter who you think is a dickhead. And, and plus on top of that, you know, and I say the same thing about the WGA strike, which obviously I'm hugely in support of, um, the, there are also people who aren't, aren't working like the caterers, the people who clean the place, right? All of these things are built on an infrastructure that is propping up an entire class of people. And like, that's where I feel the real pain is. You that's know? right. And, I, I, I want to say, cause like there is part of me, I think for the literary part of me, cause I'm not in the WGA Yeah. and I don't get paid like a TV writer mm-hmm. and even the lowest rung of TV writer gets paid more that by, by an order of magnitude than the average writer of literary fiction. And so I'm happy to see them, like, go get the money, you know, mm-hmm. and get it in particular, like you're saying, on behalf of, like, the truly working class people who are really the ones suffering. Um, I'm not saying that people don't have stress who are writers, but, like, I sort of understand some of the pushback where it's like, you know, you're really not downtrodden you're making like healthy six figures even as like an entry-level writer right I just seem it's so hard to say everyone's situation is so different but I will say you might be making money for the time you're in the room right but I'll I, I, I think the thing with streaming is they really conned them out of getting any residuals and that right. is where okay maybe you did get a good amount of money for six months or and four then, months and then you're out And then if you don't budget that, and then, you know what I mean? Like I, it's, and I have to be honest, even if you are making that money, I have friends who do well comparatively, right? But they still are week to week. And there are weeks where they hand in an episode and they literally say, I think I'm getting fired next week. And so as much as I'm like, yeah, there's decent money on the table. There's also nothing but precarity. I mean, you think that to me is so stressful every week that if you don't show up and say really smart shit for 12 hours on a zoom about this script, or if you turn in something they don't like, you're out that I, I don't want that. I don't want that job. It's such a fucked up business. Isn't that crazy? Like, and, and then, and then let's say you do survive all that and you write a hit and you never see a dime and the, but the network is making money hand over fist because people keep watching it, right? Like, I think one of my friends told me it used to be that you could be on a show and you would be on that same show for 10 seasons and you never had to worry about looking for another job and you got residuals and you could buy a house and live a normal life. But now, because there's no seasons, there's eight episodes of everything, you need to be on seven shows a year to make the kind of money that you would make on one show. 
that was consistent, you know what I mean? And so it is kind of like a gig economy now and the residuals thing is huge, but even more to the point, the point that they're making about AI and ChatGPT, I don't think there's another organized body in the United States that's gonna be able to push that conversation into the legal place that they are, which is that you know, visual artists, they, they didn't have a union. It's very hard to prove copyright over visual style unless you're like Van Gogh, right? But with text, it's pretty clear this is plagiarism. Like if this machine needs to eat my work in order to copy my work, then what it's putting out is plagiarism by definition. And you can't put a copyright on that. You can't, you know, <laughs> that's not... So I think in terms of legality, I'm hugely in support because I don't think anyone else is pushing that conversation. Here's the thought I've had. Yeah. Is that I think that using AI for creative writing is inevitable. And I think that what's gonna happen, and I don't think it's necessary, I think it'll be something that secretly writers like, is that first drafts might be generated by AI and then writers will write over the top of it and personalize it. I think that's what's going to happen. I'm not saying I'm in favor of it. I'm not, I haven't thought this through. I'm not a, you know, this is not my area of expertise, but just as like a practical matter, like sitting there and having to generate and like grind through a first draft and all that kind of stuff, or you have a machine do it at a relative level of sophistication, and then you get to personalize it and touch it up and make it your own. Isn't that probably what's going to happen? I don't know. I mean, I don't think it's actually as good as everyone's acting like it is. Like I've, I've never, seen, I've never used it. I say this I've having seen, never I've used it. I've seen the output. It's like it would get a C in college. It's not, you know. And so maybe if I'm sure there's somebody who's like pressed for time, um, I, I think it would more hurt people in genre writing. I think literature is kind of a different bag. You know what I mean? Like the AI doesn't understand suffering. <laughs> so like, not I don't, yet. right, right. Um, like, you know, I don't know. Somebody said the other day, like, if you're good at what you do, you don't need to worry about it. And I, I kind, I kind of believe that in some way, like, you know, I, I think if you're doing something niche, that's hard to rip off, you're a little, you know, insulated. I think if you're writing a romance novel, you probably have some problems. Like, you know, I could see Danielle Steele being just a bot now, and she already was though. Reality is they already were, right? A lot of these people already had 15 people writing the book to begin with, um, you know. Right, right. So I don't know. I it's don't know hard. either. It's a tough time. I don't know either. It is, and it's. I feel like you know. I think it's important that they have this battle out in public, like you're saying, because if there are ways to cut costs and to mechanize what was previously done by human beings, you know, these studio people will do that in a heartbeat. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I think the actors should be just as worried, if not more so. Like they don't even need to be on set anymore if this goes the right. You know what I mean? Like it could render your face way more easily than it can render a novel. All they what about, do... do writers like do do authors of books have a union? I know there's an author's guild, but like it doesn't feel like it has any teeth. Like when are we going to get a fucking union? <laughs> you know, there's something I said that the other day in an interview and the girl was like, actually, we do have a union. I'm the president of it and you're supposed to be in it. And I was like, fuck, she just sent me some info about it. I have to look into it, but I've been so busy with book stuff. But yeah, no, there is one. I think it fell out of favor and it didn't have as many members, but now it's like coming back. So we, we need to build, I know, build I know. that shit up. I Let's feel like, do it. I know. Yeah. I feel bad. They emailed me about it and I was like, I can't do anything about this till August. I just have to get through press stuff first and then I can be a good union girl. <laughs> but yeah. yes, there is one. And I immediately stopped running around saying shit like we should have a union because it turns out my friend. Well, listen, listen, it feels <laughs> like it. Listen, it feels like we don't have one. I agree. You know, right. if we have one, then let's feel it. Let's see. Like what's. <laughs> What's the benefit of the union? You know, like let's let's negotiate collectively. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I want to talk to you about, you know, going back to this startup culture that you're painting in your novel and Cassie's experiences at this company Voyager. Uh, there's some great characters that, you know, in some ways, are stock characters, and I think intentionally, but they're still true to life. And I'm going to say the CEO, Corbett, one of the small gods, Sasha, who's fucking hilarious and awful. She's like just the sociopath, you know, and somebody who's actually incompetent, but is somehow a founder and like is mean as a snake. 
and has all these great like super you know super cruel lines in the book uh but i want to home in on the ceo character in particular Mm -hmm. because i feel like the ceo character in this world and in particular in american life is sort of imbued with these kind of messianic qualities we love nothing more than to valorize the achievements of the founder in America when the founder, you know, has had great success. And in tech culture, it's like the Mark Zuckerbergs, the Elon Musks, the Jack Dorseys, you know, all of these guys who are like intentionally dressed down. I've talked about this on this show. You alluded to it earlier, like the way that they intentionally dress down. It feels intentional anyway, as a way to sort of turn the threat level down, especially when they're doing things that aren't so great. It's like, uh, you know, look at Mark Zuckerberg. He's wearing like flip flops and a hoodie. How dangerous could he possibly be? <laughs> you know, I, I think if you, I think this is the first time in human history that people have actively hid the wealth. If you think about it, it's really crazy. In all other times, there's been a signifier that somebody's rich. This is the first, I really think we're in the first time period where people have ever wanted to hide it. And yeah. so that blows my mind. Um, what Conspicuous consumption, I think is what it's called. So that that's been something fascinating to think about, um, especially when it comes to yeah. these CEOs who really are little boys. Like they're just not they're not even more experienced than anyone most of the time. You know, um, I do wonder yeah. if we're kind of at the end of that now, because I think, you know, when you see the CEOs of like Uber and like all those horror stories now coming out and turning into like TV series and stuff like that. You know, I jokingly, I'm like, I guess everyone's NDA was up. <laughs> and so now they can be honest about what's going on. And so I have heard anecdotally that like investments in Silicon Valley are down and people are no more bad boy CEO is, you know, so I don't know if that's on the way out. I'm, I'm curious to see if that's true or not. I mean, I know people are definitely being more fiscally conservative right now anyway, but um, it seems like the appetite to create another one of those monsters is is down now. Well, that's good. I mean, and yeah, right? the, uh, even so though, you know, just the way that the hierarchy works inside of a company and especially a company that's got kind of a gold rush fever to it, where everybody who shows up there day after day and sort of gives their lives to the company is driven by the possibility that they might make fuck you money. That mm-hmm. is it. That is what mm-hmm. Silicon Valley is about. And the CEO figures in these companies, you know, they're trying to be leaders of men and women and, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're there to sort of motivate and inspire. And a lot of these people have huge egos and the way that you draw the CEO character in this novel is like very knowing and funny to me. This guy who's got kind of like very physically fit. He's not as he's, he's got like kind of bottomless energy, but he's also like insulated by a ton of privilege Mm -hmm. and likely isn't working well, maybe he is. I don't know. CEOs often work quite a lot. They're often like workaholics, but I feel like the labor of the workforce is sort of absorbing a lot of the stress. And this dude, you know, he's sort of like the messiah of the company, right? Well, I mean, isn't that the dream? Like you somehow convince a bunch of people to give the, your like their lives to you, and but the stock deal they're never going to get anywhere near what you're going to get. Right. It's like the best, it's like the best Ponzi scheme. Yeah. You're going to get, you're going to cash out huge. And it's like a hundred thousand dollars, which to people who don't come from money, that's a shitload of money, you know? And I think, I think one thing the book is also trying to get at is she doesn't come from a family with any financial literacy. Right. And so that's a huge part of what shapes her understanding of money and going after it. And, you know, I've heard lots of stories about people who have been at companies that are, have gone public and are huge that got stock and handled it the wrong way. And now are like more broke than they ever were because there's all these things that a relatively lower middle class or poor person would have no idea about all these rules, all these taxes. Like it's, even if you do, get on the rocket ship and it goes public. The stuff that comes with that, if you don't have any understanding of how to navigate it, you're fucked. You know, you're, you're way worse off than you were before. Um, and so I think that is something else where, you know, the sea level does get a big pass, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's the thing too. It's like, 
I worked at a company where everybody was getting these shares and it was all this talk about vesting and you know if you made it through your four years you were going to be fine and then it was going to and none of them have seen a dime still like it's... yeah i i've been in tech for a pretty long time and i've my the company i'm at now did go public but that's one in a decade or 15 years of companies that i've worked for that have all given me stock and given me less cash as, you know what I mean? When you're young enough, you fall for it, where it's like, oh, well, you're going to get stock, and it sounds fancy. It sounds like, you know, but the reality is most of the time, you just might as well set that shit on fire. And, you know, eventually you learn, I can't eat stock. I can't pay rent in stock. <laughs> this is this is monopoly money. <laughs> this does right. not mean shit. Um, but I will, and, and you, know, I, you know, being in a company that goes public is a really crazy feeling. It's... Uh, it's like the pinnacle of capitalism and you get caught up in it. I certainly got excited the day we went public. We went on Wall Street and rang the bell and like, you know. Y you rang the bell? No, fuck no, no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but you like, you know, it's kind of like when your team wins the Super Bowl, you see your guy get up and he rings the bell. And, you know, I'm very lucky right now. I finally found, you know, a company that's like human to people. I actually love our CEO. He's like older and he's so kind he's very empathetic he like loves dogs he's just like a good person and i keep waiting for him to like fuck up <laughs> but he doesn't he's just well that's awesome. true that needs to be said too there are it's not like every company is evil or every ceo is a sociopath like maybe the reason why it's successful is the fact that he isn't you know maybe exactly. that, maybe yeah, that's instructive I, but yeah i think that uh too often these workplaces and it's very complicated it's not easy to run a company where you're existing on venture capital you're trying to build it up you're under a lot of pressure to deliver for investors you've got all these people that you've hired and you're trying to make everybody happy it's not easy to run a company i would not want to do it and yeah. you know even after you go public then you just have to answer to wall street so right. it's not like you know i mean even that's kind of the thing when i see these like ceos now like going out of pocket. And even when I think about the WGA strike, at some point your shareholders are gonna be like, uh, go back to work. Like, <laughs> you know, we need shows. You can't, I we invested heavily in this company, David Zaslav, and you should probably make a show <laughs> because this is costing us a lot of money, right. you know? Um, so, I, you know, you just answer to a different boss at that point. Well. Know? The way that you render Cassie's experience at Voyager in this novel captured something for me on the page that I haven't seen done enough. And you got it, you got it like very true to life in my experience. And it's the way that work culture can overtake a person and sort of like one's identity can become subsumed with their work life and their performance at work and what's happening at work. And this has happened to me and I'm imagining it's happened to you. It definitely oh, happens yeah. to Cassie. Cause like one of the things I love is that even as Cassie is sort of aware of the con, even as she is sort of like seeing the darkness to a degree that I think a lot of people aren't and is made uncomfortable by it to a degree that a lot of characters in this book are not, you know, the Sasha character, the CEO, obviously the Corbett, they don't have as nearly the, like the moral quandary within them that Kathy, you know, that Cassie has within her. And even so, she's like, at certain turns, let's go get them. Let's destroy them. You know, like she's, she's not like Lily, like she's not like angelic, you know, is the point. Yeah. And she's not, she's not beyond like sort of falling for the, the spell of capitalism and gold. Rush. I don't know if she falls for it or she knows how to play. You know, like, I think her dad taught her, you're going to have to play ball while you're there, you know? And I think that's true. Like, I, my dad would say all the time, like, once you get past a certain amount of money, they own your ass. And, like, that means you're, you're you know what I mean? If you're making half a million dollars a year, you're there 24 hours a day, whatever somebody needs, you know? And so um, I think she understands she at least has to pay lip service. And it's also a place where she's under such surveillance that, like, you know, she can't make a misstep. Even when she throws up in the bathroom and her boss knows 20 minutes later, and she, you know, and is like, you okay? And she's, you know, it, you can't, you can't fuck up because you can just so easily be replaced by somebody from Stanford, which is right in the backyard, who is gonna have 
all the energy and be all in. And so even if you don't believe it, you have to at least say it, you know. <sighs> No. Stressful, stressful. I, <laughs> I mean, she, I think she understands. Somebody asked me about like, is she complicit, right? And I, and it's like hard to say because she so needs the money and she can't, you know, to move back is going to cost her tens of thousands of dollars or to even just to get her shit and leave, you know, that's, and so she is really backed into a corner where if she loses this job, not only does she have her family saying like, you don't have a place back here, but like, she's got to start all over again and she doesn't have the money to do that. And so it's, it's hard for me when I ask if she's complicit, it's hard because her, her literal life depends on her having this job right now. She cannot and live in San Francisco without it. And so that's how people, that, that's what every, you know, that's the ordinary experience of it is people going into work and maybe doing things and behaving in ways that are at cross purposes with how they actually feel or what they truly believe simply because they're like existentially terrified <laughs> and there's a great like recurring uh line in the book or a way that she characterizes this and i think you know like you say maybe cassie's not as complicit maybe she just is knows how to operate it just is what it is she's sort of resigned to it but she repeatedly throughout the novel refers to her fake self and like the way that you're in these work situations and your boss is s saying something absurd to you that like if you were being a real human being you'd be like no that's fucked up i'm not doing that or i don't agree at all but then your fake self turns on and you go that sounds great i'll get I'm right on, on it i'm on it i'll get right on it yeah and like that that is corrosive i think to the human spirit but isn't that how we end up everywhere isn't that how we ended up with nazis and you know what i mean like people falling into line for self-preservation it's like what we do you know even outside of work, it's what we do. Like, you might do things. Does anybody not do it? I, that's, not, that's what I mean. That's what I'm wondering. Like, don't you sometimes, I, I don't know, don't you sometimes do things you don't want to do in order to, like, keep the peace? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, like, or to keep the money. Keep the money yeah, rolling in. Keep the job. Keep the Stanford grad from coming in and taking your position, right? I mean, or, like, keep your marriage. Keep your kids happy, right? Like, there's all these things that we negotiate and have to, I mean, I think about it, especially like as a woman, when I consider marriage, I think, you know, I sort of assume I would have to give up a lot. Like what? All the things I want to do. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, if you're in a relationship, I mean, I think whatever, you could be married or you could just be in a relationship. If yeah. You're a, if you're in a serious relationship, then it's not just you. Yeah, there's going to no, be compromise and... That's not for everybody, I guess. No, and there's probably times in a relationship you got to put on your fake self, right? Like, I don't want to go to your family reunion. You just pick your battles. Exactly. And you, have, and you have to sacrifice. But I think that sacrificing for someone you love in a relationship is different, for, different than sacrificing something with, like, a moral implication in a workplace for somebody you don't even respect. <laughs> True. Okay, fair, fair, yeah. fair. I love how we're just going into, like, straight therapy talk. But I guess... <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is, um, as humans, there are often times where we're having to kind of hide what we want in order to maintain the status quo and so that things don't fall apart, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's life to some extent. I mean, like, you know, the world is hard and you sort of just have to toughen up and deal with it and accept it on its own terms. This is something right, maybe... we'll just cut out the part I said about relationships. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're keeping that in. We're keeping so it in. Cynical. No, it's so <laughs> cynical. <laughs> but, you know, I think that I think that it's hard to not be cynical in life and especially in the world as presently constituted. And I think, you know, that... I, yeah, I mean, I think about that all the time, like there was a version of the book where it ends with her like girl bossing and like taking the company down and it felt so fake. You know, like she in one version of it, she like reports them to the New York Times and like they're going to get theirs. And it just felt she's not going to do that. And also they would just be replaced by another company or, you know, they'd get their wrist slapped or whatever. And it does. It just felt I, I don't know. It didn't feel true. You know, I'm interested to hear that. The fact that you went down those roads, because I could see how you might. You have to consider it, right? I mean, most of what editing is, other than at the line level, is like poking holes in the plot. Like, you know, what if the black hole was talking to her? Like, there were drafts where that happened. What if the black hole ate techies? And that's what, there was drafts where that happened, right? Like, you start kind of 
pushing things into different places to see if they make sense or if they riddle out and it really didn't it really didn't riddle out and i i don't even think i thought she would go you know spoiler alert turn this off if you don't want it i don't even know if i thought she would go into the black hole at the end um but then it kind of became like chekhov's black hole where i was like of course she is why else would it be there? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like in the end, you're like, of course, if you know, when I, and I was kind of asking that question when we were in lockdown, like if you had a way to like take yourself to another dimension during those two years where it was hell on earth to be here, would you have peaced out and like checked out another dimension? Would you have stuck around and just stayed in your house terrified? You know, like, I think she's starting to ask herself, like, if this is what it is to be alive right now, then like, maybe there's something better somewhere else that's like not here you know mm -hmm. well i felt like it was an it's like a great ending because it felt both like inevitable and surprising at the same time and you know i want to talk as you mentioned this black hole thing about the collision between sort of like the fantastical aspects of this novel and the very contemporary reality that you're like taking the reader through it feels very familiar and that's not an easy trick to pull is to make both of those things happen in the same narrative where it feels like, oh yeah, this is a world I recognize. San Francisco, tech culture, contemporary office culture, startup culture, relationships that are, you know, odd and, I don't know, like odd and, but also no, recognizable, yeah. like, pa like there's a lot of like passion and romance to it, but it's also like the guy's in an open relationship and is going home to another woman. Like that's a little bit stressful. I kind of wanted the relationship to function exactly as San Francisco did, where it looks really good in the beginning. And, you know, he he isn't ethical in the sense that, like, he doesn't tell her until she's obviously emotionally invested and she's not going to, like, get up and leave, you know. And the same thing is true of Voyager, right? You know, when you take a job, you only spend, like, eight hours with those people and you sign up and you're probably going to have to stay there for at least a year if you're going to try to be reasonable about anything. But you can't really suss out in, the, in eight hours you know, how, what's really going on behind closed door? What is the culture really like? What are they actually doing with data, right? So you make a pretty big decision based on not a lot of information. And I think the chef is like almost exactly the same thing to a T. Like she spends like 20 hours with this person and she's really into him and then he drops this bomb and she can't really disentangle herself, you know? Mm -hmm. So he is, he is San Francisco, but just a man essentially, yeah. All right, well, the only other thing that's that I want to talk about relative to the book, I mean, we've covered a lot of it, and I feel like you know, listeners should have the gist, and uh, you know, whatever they don't have, they can read. But there are, like, throughout the book, I noticed like suffering men. Oh yeah. So there is most notably the man on fire, which is sort of a horrifying. Uh, you know, image and scene in the book where this dude like lights himself on fire, he self immolates. And that is a like a prominent symbol in the book and sort of like calls to mind Burning Man, <laughs> the, the festival, which is so I think connected to Bay Area culture. I mean, that's where it originated. And uh, have you been to Burning Man? Yeah, no, okay. <laughs> have you? you? I have. 19 Are you a burner? 1999. I went for a work trip. I conned my first boss into letting me go shoot a documentary film there in 1999. What was it like? It was much more chill. It was l much less commercial. It was like 25,000 people at that point. So it was still, mm. it was still significant, but like, it's not what it is now with like, none of the tech CEOs were there like choppered in or whatever. All that bullshit was not happening. So I kind of feel like I got in, I guess at that point it was the 15th year something like that so i feel like i got in just under the wire but i only went once you know i'm so glad you're not a secret burner if i found out you were a burner i would have listen i listen i understand why it's like an eye roll but i think everybody should go at least once maybe it's oh. changed maybe it's changed so much that it's just awful but it's extraordinary the okay. like like you i think in particular as somebody who loves visual art would actually be really inspired by what happens out there at that level. You know, I did go out to the Salton Sea and there's like some art stuff 
I think they take from Burning Man and then they put there because the the edge of the shore looks like Saint. It's like, you know. Um, and so I did see some stuff that was really incredible. So I'll consider it, but I'm not going to Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. My wife, my wife also never going to Burning Man. I've I've had this conversation where I'm like, it's sort of like going to Mardi Gras. You want to like tick the box, but she's like, no thanks. Like I can't. literally think it says I only have like one dating profile up because I really don't have time to date right now. And it says like, do not try to take me to Burning Man on it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so wait, back to what you were saying about the men suffering. Um, you know, that part of the book, all that stuff is true. Like the first day that I was going to work in San Francisco, I went to get a coffee at this shop before I got on the train and the owner was there and she was pouring me a coffee and I said I was new to the neighborhood and she asked where I was from and I said Philly and she's like, you know, it's dangerous here. You got to be careful. And I was like, I'm from Philadelphia. It's like a top 10 murder city. Like I'm fine. I say the same thing about LA. Everyone's like, be safe. And I'm like, you guys aren't even in the top 25 murder cities. Like I'm from a top 10. I'm fine. Um, but anyway, and she said that the night before a man had set himself on fire outside of her coffee shop and she was clearly still really shaken and she had tried to put him out. And, um, when she told me to be careful, she's like, that's what I'm talking about. It's not a normal place. And I think it, and what it neighborhood was, like, was this? Uh, I was, I was living in the mission. Oh yeah. That's yeah, crazy. And, that, that, like the, that's a, I've walked that like, and you're just like, oh my God. That's a, I mean, I was on like 21st in Valencia, so I wasn't like deep, deep in, but I, I will say that I think that it would be too heavy handed to use that as foreshadowing in a book. But in re real life, I think it was the first time where I started thinking like, okay, maybe I moved to a, a bad place. You know what I mean? Like, I think it was the first time where I was like, and I kind of pushed it aside and I was like, that's so sad. It really fucked me up, obviously, to hear it. I wasn't like, you know, but I don't, I tried not to take it as like a description of the place or anything, but it did end up kind of being the first moment where it was introduced to me, this idea that the place might be kind of rotten. Um, and then the men throwing themselves on the train. I mean, that, that would just happen enough that I would be late coming home, you know. People um, throwing themselves in front of the oh, tracks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It happened yeah. a lot. Uh, probably three or four times. You know what I mean? In the, in the year that I was there, that's like, you know, you, and sometimes they would, I don't think they would announce it on the system all the time. You would find out in the paper later, or, you know, most of the time you'd have to figure it out and follow it up. I, don't, I just, yeah, but yeah, it, that happens. That happens. Yeah. yeah. And then there's the man, uh, the man beneath her window, which we talked about already, just kind also of like real. living in the streets, suffering, like you say, constantly. And then there are near, the office that she works in at Voyager, like the bathing men, the men who are bathing in what? Of like a weird river. Yeah. Also, also real. I mean, you know, so it's just interesting to me because obviously the like late capitalism takes its toll on everybody. It doesn't, you know, it's not gender specific, but it's just interesting to me that there are repeatedly these yeah, sort of I... like men who are just sort of like, what's the word for it? You know, they've been, they've been lost to it in some way. I do think, you know, that is an interesting thing to talk through. I think I wonder if maybe the men aren't more visible than the women in these scenarios, because it's like so unsafe that they're, that the women are like more in a hidden, like, I feel like it is more often men, or at least it was what I saw. I mean, obviously there's women as well and like non-binary obviously, but, um, I, you know, the points that you're bringing up from the book, yeah, all of those were real and all of them were men, you know, hmm. uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's I mean, tough. It's tough to live around that sort of suffering and like you oh, said, yeah. and, and to not know what to do. That's, I mean, that's in LA too. I mean, it's everywhere, but I think in these big cities, you see it in a more concentrated way. And the homelessness is obviously, or the unhousedness of uh, LA and San Francisco, it's obviously gets a lot of press, but to be confronted with it repeatedly if you're a person who has like a, a heart, it does something to you. Yeah. I mean, even by the time I left, when I left out, uh, San Francisco, um, and I moved, I moved to Austin and that's where I wrote the book. Cause that's where I was during lockdown. I remember sleeping for the first time, like really sleeping and realizing that like this man who had been under my window, I had been just, I hadn't realized it, but I hadn't been able to like rest. You know what I mean? Cause you hear somebody in that much pain in his heart, you can't really go into a deep sleep when you're like 
worried about somebody, but you don't know how to, you know, care for them. But I will say too, I mean, it had gotten, you know, that way in Austin as well, you know? And so, I, like I said, I, I don't know a city where that's not going to be happening right now. So you notoriously fled Austin and moved to Los Angeles. <laughs> And then yeah. wrote a, you wrote about it in what Time Magazine or something, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's talk about that. You came to LA because you just could not take uh, Texas politics, particularly as it pertains to like women's health issues. Yeah, uh, you know it's kind of crazy. I, I think I think if you didn't live in a state where you were seeing places get shuttered and seeing care actively denied, it was like seismic. Right, like I know there are so many issues that are happening politically. I know there are so many bad things happening. This feels like the only time people have actively lost rights, right? Like actively a giant step back, you know? And I like imagine if they were like, okay, if your state doesn't want to have gay marriage, it's out. If your state, you know what I mean? Like the, the, if we took these like core things and just- And by the way, that's potentially- On the table. Yeah. It's on the table, right? But the thing is that worries me is that it happened for anyone with ovaries and we didn't burn down buildings together. We didn't band together. We just got mad for two weeks and then we kind of just, okay. And it's like, dude, the birth rate went up 5% in Texas already. That's crazy. That's crazy. And so anyway, watching those, you know, places get shuttered and it just also I'm single so like I'm not gonna live in a state that's gonna like literally force me to have a child or you know criminalize me right like the only solution then is just like straight up abstinence right <laughs> it's like you know bodies aren't perfect every every person I know who can have a child every time you have sex you're doing math you're doing math you're thinking okay we did use a condom we did use birth control but I don't know like it is constantly on your mind and now even more so, you know, and on top of Roe, obviously that was huge. And, you know, something that kind of fascinates me is I wrote this and sold this way before Roe was overturned. And I thought the abortion was like, okay, whatever. You're so edgy, Sarah. Like I almost took it out. And so it like blows my mind to see the book being published now where like suddenly that feels really fucking important to see someone who is of age with a job making a decision that she wouldn't be a good mother and choosing not to have a child because she can't do it. She can't do it emotionally. She can't do it financially. She, like, she and she'd be doing it alone. She would be doing it yeah. in the absence of a father, like who yeah. would be participating most likely in the uh, raising of the child. And it felt really important to show someone who wasn't like an 18 year old girl sneaking across state lines. It's like, this is a grown up who knows this is a hard decision, but it's the right one. And like, I hope that it starts to illustrate how important it is for someone in that situation to have compassionate care instead of like people throwing rosaries at them. You know, it's not like right. she thinks it's fun that she's doing this. It clearly tears her up. She's not a bad person, but she also knows that like any child she has right now is going to carry whatever like messed up things she's got going on are just going to pervade and she doesn't have the money and she doesn't have a support system for, you know, so um, it suddenly becomes radical, which is crazy to me that within this short amount of time, it's gone from being like, oh my God, all right, Sarah, that plot point, well, whatever. And now I'm like, thank God it's in there. You it, know? Feels, it feels very relevant and, and emotionally powerful. And I think sometimes there is something predictive about fiction writers. I've talked about this with other writers on the show where, you know, you're sort of absorbing news and you're reading deeply and you have these things that preoccupy you emotionally and otherwise. And then there's some sort of like magical synthesis that happens as you're telling a story and lo and behold, you know, the culture catches up or the book hits the moment and you're like, Oh, you know, there was something kind of predictive in it. You know, I honestly think that way sometimes about my dad. Like I was writing about a daughter losing her father in the book of X and he died like five months after that came out. And you know, now with this book, same thing, right? Like it's, and so I think Roe was overturned four months after we sold it to Scribner. And uh, maybe I should just write a really nice book. 
I was going to say. <laughs> where I win the lottery. I, okay, okay. I was going to say, can you write one where I win the lottery? That would be awesome. Can you imagine Brad wins the lottery is my next book? <laughs> Please. <laughs> by the way, by the way, huge audience for such a book. I think it would do very well. You'd be, you'd be, like, you'd be foolish not to write it. Supermodel Brad Listy. <laughs> <laughs> Movie star Brad Listy. One day buys a lotto ticket and then uh, you're just having the best life. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I, somebody did jokingly say like, you should go write a book where you win the lottery because you know, the, even the press tour for this book, you know, it's kind of a downer. I, you know, I was just saying to you before we kind of went live, like, the girl who wrote the book about the history of hot dogs where like she's got her head shot and she's holding a hot dog jamie loftus i think is her name okay like, i haven't i haven't heard of this okay it's called raw dog it's like the history of hot dogs and i'm like her press tour has to be so much fun mine's like abortion depression black holes capitalism and hers is probably just like hot but dogs. listen listen delicious 85 percent of people 85 <laughs> percent of people eating a hot dog have had an abortion and are depressed. I'm just going to put that out there. If you're yes. if you're if you're eating a hot dog, you're probably dealing with some serious dark thoughts. Honestly, I'm not even kidding. Somebody was like, "Do you think everybody has their own black hole?" And I was like, "Everyone I know, yeah. <laughs> every Except, writer certainly." Like, there's I, just a few bozos out there, but they are just they're they are genetic rarity. Imagine so. having a great time all the time. I've known people like that that like Isn't literally it? are just sort of just like their baseline is like very happy to be alive but i also i don't know there's also some sort of undercurrent of like com competitiveness to it it's like competitive happiness, competitive I'm, happiness i'm fucking happy yeah like it's you like, know whoa so the, yeah it feels like they could snap at any moment i don't know it doesn't seem real to me i don't know how anybody I hope goes. you have like an excel spreadsheet with all their names so you can <laughs> note when they snap like maybe you can yeah. pick who you think's gonna go first i could do a whole series <laughs> podcast series on it that'd be great <laughs> Who Maybe, snapped? Yeah, who snapped? <laughs> yeah, it'll be called like, oh, snap. Or I don't know. We'll that would be good. That would be good. Um, I, Tommy, my best friend is Tommy Pico. And he... Who has guessed it on this show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He loves you. Um, that's why he messed with my microphone. I said, I have to use that microphone to talk to Brad Listy. And he like messed with all the knobs and left. And I was like, I hate you. <laughs> anyway, anyway um, you know... I don't know. He, he's a goofball. I forget what I was going to tell you about Tommy. Oh, oh, oh. He doesn't have a Twitter account anymore. And so, but every time we hang out, he's like, what, what are the girls saying on Twitter? Like, what, <laughs> what's happening on Twitter? And I'm like, we're going to have a podcast called What Are the Girls Saying? Where I explain Twitter <laughs> drama to you and then you respond to it. Like, I'm like, the girls are talking about submarines right now. <laughs> Right. <laughs> the girls are talking about a Russian coup. Um, but yeah, that's my next podcast. It's going to be after you do Who Snap, then I'll do What Are the Girls Saying? <laughs> Sounds great. That's yeah. We could build an empire. Um, it's been fun to talk with you. Congratulations oh, on this thanks. book. I always end by asking if my guest is working on anything new. It is fine if you are not, but is there another book in the offing? There will be. I, I, uh, this, this part I've given, I give myself permission when I have to do the external capitalism shit. I don't write at this point. I but just can't. Is there anything in process, like, or no? Or do you have I've some got idea? ideas. You got I've ideas. Got yeah, but I need to go back in my little hole where nobody talks to me and doesn't make me go on their podcast. All right. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I was gonna actually say I always love talking to you. Um, cool. So thank you for having me. It means a lot to me.